Welcome friends, welcome back to the kitchen, welcome back to Sunday Morning and the Old Cookbook Show. Today is uh, chocolate mayonnaise cake part deux. Uh, last week, well in fact only moments ago, but last week on the show and only moments ago in my timeline, I made this, uh, this mayonnaise cake from 1927. Uh, told the whole story about, you know, how it shows up in the newspaper, blah 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 blah. That cake exists from 1927 into the 1950s. But uh, the cake we're going to do today, its first appearance in a newspaper or in publication or, you know, published essentially, is 1945. And that's kind of significant because 1937 um, is the year that's often bandied about by a lot of people saying that um, in 1937 this recipe appears on the label of a Hellman's mayonnaise jar. And I haven't been able to find that anywhere. I have, I have contacted Hellman's um, and spoken to people there trying to get a picture or a PDF or some confirmation that this indeed did show up on a Hellman's mayonnaise jar in 1937. Um, and nobody seems to have it, but they all sort of toe the line. Oh yeah, no, no, we had it in 1937, but they can't actually prove it. Which is really strange to me um, because realistically, this cake that we're going to make today does not show up in any of the cookbooks that I own. It doesn't show up in any of the church cookbooks, community cookbooks, um, any of the, the properly published or, or curated cookbooks. It doesn't show up in newspapers. It doesn't show up anywhere until 1945. And that is in a newspaper in Louisville, Kentucky. And that article in the newspaper in Louisville, Kentucky is also very interesting because it is the sort of the genesis the starting point, the kernel of another piece of mythology that surrounds this cake. So let's get started. Um, the recipe, as it's as it's related in this article, the uh, the recipe writer says that you know one of her male colleagues at the newspaper sent her this recipe, and she sort of she reacts to it kind of dismissively. He sent me this this recipe, and it has mayonnaise in it, and I don't want to do have anything to do with mayonnaise, and and she sort of you know pushes it aside in the way that she's writing about it and that it took her a few days to get around to making it because she didn't really want to make it, but then she loves it. So I think that sort of approach is interesting and I, and I wonder if that's just the writing style of that writer, if she approached a lot of her writing that way. Um, so in this bowl I've put flour, sugar, this is cocoa powder, salt, and baking soda. And I'm just gonna whisk that together. And so the, the other part of her, of her article or column that day was about the $100 cake. And the story goes, a uh, woman goes to New York City. She has lunch at one of the, uh, one of the big hotels. She has this cake for, for dessert, absolutely loves it, goes home. All she can think about is this cake, this cake, this cake, this cake, this cake. She writes to the hotel and says, I'd love to have the recipe for that cake. I'll even pay for it. So, of course, the hotel obliges with the recipe, sends it to her, and then sends her a bill for 100 bucks. She needed to pay for the she needed to pay for the recipe, $100. And so it was it was a chocolate cake, but it was not the mayonnaise cake. The mayonnaise cake was a separate part of this article. They were two completely separate stories. This recipe disappears. I cannot find any mention of it between this first appearance in 1945 in any of the newspapers or ephemera until 1948. In 1948 it comes back with a vengeance. It comes back we would today we would call it viral. Today we would call it viral. It comes back in a big way and it is in every newspaper across the United States. Essentially exactly the same recipe. Um, a little bit different amounts for the cocoa powder but that's about it. And people at that point start calling it the hundred dollar cake. The two stories have been mixed together at some point between 1945 and 1948. And people have have mistook this cake for the $100 cake. But again, still, 1948, no mention of, of, of Hellman's mayonnaise or Best Foods mayonnaise. Because Hellman's and Best Foods are the same brand, the same company. One is just the western part of, of North America and one is the eastern part of North America. But in 1948, you see a lot of these recipes talk about Kraft mayonnaise. And that could just be because Kraft mayonnaise was available um, continent-wide. There was no divide uh, between the two, but there's no mention of Hellman's mayonnaise at all. 
So I just put in the vanilla. It tells me to put the vanilla in at this point. I would have put the vanilla in the water um, so that it mixes in a little bit better, but who knows. Next in is the mayonnaise, three quarters of a cup. Now this recipe continues on um, into the 1950s and into the 1960s. The first time that I can see this recipe associated with Hellman's um, is in the late 1960s in some of their magazine articles. So we need uh, about three quarters of a cup of mayonnaise. So late 1960s. But in the 1950s, this recipe starts to change again and people start adding raisins. Now, if you remember in that cake, there are dates and nuts. So the addition of raisins sort of takes the cake back a little bit. Um, and I, I, so I find this fascinating for a bunch of reasons because there's so much mythology around the idea of this cake and where it came from and what it was about. And I can't substantiate any of that mythology. You know, I just, I just can't substantiate it. I can't find the reasoning behind it. And you know, a lot of people say that this cake um, came out of the depression because people couldn't buy eggs and oil, but somehow they could buy mayonnaise, prepared mayonnaise. Uh, that doesn't stand up. And in fact, in some of the newspaper articles about this cake, people specifically call it out and say, it is an expensive, extravagant cake to make. So the whole idea that it was something that was cheap and easy to make uh, during the depression sort of goes out the window when you've got people in the time period saying, no, this is a really expensive cake. Um, you know, it's a good cake, but it's really expensive. Okay, so I'm gonna switch from the whisk to a rubber spatula just to do the last mixing. So in the 1945 article, she says that she was supposed to bake it in a tube pan, but she didn't have a tube pan, so she did it in, I think, a 9x9, nine nine, but you could do it neither. Um, I searched downstairs. I couldn't find my tube pan, but I've got a bunt pan. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bake it in a bunt pan, because why not? I think bunt pans are kind of fun. And this batter is kind of interesting to me. There's a couple of other articles that I read about this cake in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s. And I'm going to be kind of interested to see what the texture is like. Um, but we'll get this in the oven and we'll get it baked up and we'll see what happens. Into the oven. Okay, so the final nail in the coffin of the mythology around it being invented by the wife of someone who worked at an executive at at Hellman's Mayonnaise, is that in 1948, when this cake is going viral, it's in every newspaper in the United States and Canada, like it is everywhere, Best Foods, the parent company of Hellman's, invites all of the food editors of the big magazines and newspapers to New York for a giant dinner where they use mayonnaise in every dish on the menu. And the editors and the food writers are talking about, oh, have you heard about this new mayonnaise cake? It's all the rage. It's, it's all the rage. People from Best Foods didn't know anything about it. They didn't know anything about it. Hey, Glenn, it's time for hey, the next cake. It's time for the next cake. The new old cake. Oh, you already have forks. The new old cake. The new old cake. Hey, so, friends. Um, this is part of a series. That's the cake from 1927. It was quite it's good. the old, old cake. If you watched it from last week, yes. It is the old, old cake. This is the new old cake. Um, it's now perfect. It's such a perfect shape. It is. It is. It's so roundy. <laughs> hmm. Now the the nineteen forty five recipe um, doesn't give a, a frosting or an icing. Hmm. So it's still really moist. Mm -hmm. It's not super chocolatey. I think it's missing the dates. I know that's going to sound funny, right? I yeah. think it's missing the dates. The dates really brought something to that, that earlier cake. So as this cake... That being said, it's still a lovely cake. It is a lovely cake. The texture's amazing. Yeah. Really nice texture. So the, the 1945 recipe, she says, you know, you can ice it any way you want. I didn't want to ice it because I wanted to taste the cake to give a decent comparison. As this cake moves forward in time, the cocoa is removed and solid melted chocolate is put in which would change the chocolate flavor. Yes. 
1962, as I mentioned in the last episode, this cake is viewed as old fashioned. And, the, <laughs> and so the recipe columns call it old fashioned. But the way to update the cake is to put raisins in it, which takes you back to the 1927 version. So what have we learned? <laughs> what have we learned? That's a great question. I have learned that the mythology of most things that you think of are probably false. In That's this, fair. In this case, most of the mythology cannot be proven. That the idea that this is called the $100 cake is false because it was a misassociation between two parts of the same earlier um, column that introduced this recipe. That this recipe, when it's introduced in 1945, is just that recipe without the dates and the, and the, so the dates Which and the nuts. Which reminds me of how often you have someone launch a video, I just invented this, and it's like, no, here it is it's in this just, book from, just, you know, yeah. 1742, or 1932, or... It's just something new, it's just, or... it's, an, it's, a, it's the same thing cycling over and over and over again, maybe with a tweak, and the tweak was to remove the fruit and nuts, which then gets added back in, in the 1960s. Um, what else did we learn? I learned all kinds of stuff. I learned that I went down a rabbit hole on this one. <laughs> very deep, very deeply. <laughs> very deep rabbit hole, and that, um... On the surface, it's not what it seems, but it's a great cake. There you go. So, you know, any of these three cakes, I would, I would make and eat. Thanks for stopping by. See you again soon.